Long before there were religions, there were regions of the earth. Early people, following herds of animals, wandered these regions as hunters and gatherers. Walking over large areas of land and in tune with the vital earth, they occasionally discovered certain power places, perhaps a spring, a cave, or a mountain, or maybe a site that had no remarkable visual appearance. Yet these places had a mysterious power, a numinosity, and a spirit. Because of this quality, ancient people began to mark these magical places in different ways, often with piles of stones, so that the sites might be seen from a distance if other humans passed by in years to come. With the continuing seasonal movements of the animal herds, the early nomads moved too, thereby gradually discovering more and more power places on the living earth. Eventually, at different times and places, early humans learned to grow their own crops and to domesticate animals. Now, for the first time ever, they could settle in permanent locations. Where did they settle? What sites did they choose? Archaeological excavations reveal that these early people often settled at or near those power places first discovered by their wandering ancestors. These first groupings of people were small, as we know from studies of more recent nomadic settlers. Yet the groups grew in size to become clusters of huts, then villages, towns, and cities. As the social centers grew, so also did people's awareness of the characteristics of the power places. And these magical places, through their mysterious powers, affected people in different ways. This was noticed and talked about, and slowly, over long periods of time, myths arose describing the specific powers of the different sacred sites.
Living at or near these sites and feeling their energy on a daily basis, people began to notice that there were temporal fluctuations to the power of place. During the course of the yearly cycle, there were periodic increases and decreases of the localized energies. Wondering about this cyclic fluctuation of the Earth spirit, some people noticed a relationship between the positions of different celestial bodies and the amplification of the power of a place. With the passage of time, they understood that the sun and moon had a periodic influence upon the emanations of Earth spirit at particular power places. Desiring to know these charged periods in advance of their arrival, humans began to observe the night skies with greater attention. To observe with precision, they had to innovate and construct astronomical observation devices. These were quite simple in design, yet extremely accurate in function. The purposeful arrangement of individual standing stones that made it possible to set up sight lines pointing toward the horizons. These sight lines were used to carefully monitor the rise and fall of different celestial bodies along the horizon. With the passage of time, humans became ever more interested in celestial mechanics and developed increasingly sophisticated devices with which to watch the sun, moon, stars, and planets all across the globe and spanning many different archaeological epochs, our ancestors created a variety of structures that functioned as both astronomical observation devices and spiritual temples. Numerous examples can be found in different cultures, from Europe, Asia, and Africa to the Americas. Some of the oldest and most mathematically advanced examples were those created by the megalithic culture of Europe, which existed from approximately 4,000 to 1,500 years before the Christian era.
large number of pilgrimage traditions across a wide variety of cultures have revolved around tombs of saints and the images of heroes. Often these traditions assert the belief that the hero or saintly figure remains alive, transcending, at least on a spiritual plane, the reality of physical death. Heroes and saints act as signposts and guides to something beyond everyday existence. Saints formed an approachable and direct means through which ordinary people could have access to the world of the holy without requiring mediating agencies such as the priesthood. One of the reasons that relics and saints were so important was they appeared to offer the ordinary person ready access to the holy. Saintly and heroic figures who had transcended the normal realms of human existence were believed to have entered into direct or close contact with God. Although they had died, they were considered still to remain in and around their tombs, and their relics, their remains, were believed to manifest a special power to which prayers could be expressed. Christian pilgrimage developed from a desire to be near holy persons who were believed to be connected to God while on earth in those places where their physical remains were buried. This Christian emphasis on persons symbolized by objects was however superimposed on a much older tradition of pilgrimage to places that were holy in their own right, often because of some natural feature, such as a height, water source, or cave grotto, was considered to have especially sacred power. Students of mythology and cultural anthropology will be familiar with the notion that many ancient cultures held festivals on the solstices and equinoxes. The most common interpretation of these festivals is that they were symbolic occasions for renewal, the renewal of people and the land by the celestial powers, as well as the renewal of the land and the celestial beings through the agency of human intention and celebration. However, to the ancient people, their festivals were not symbolic celebrations of myth, but instead were celebrations of their current reality. That reality and the focus of events and celebration of it were profoundly influenced by the periodic energetic effects of the solar, lunar, and stellar cycles on human beings, the animal kingdom, and the earth itself.
Why were the myths and legends of so many ancient cultures associated with different celestial phenomena? Furthermore, why were particular stars often associated with certain types of deities? Could it be possible, in some mysterious way, that different celestial objects and their cycles of movement might exert subtle influences on human behavior and evolution? In support of this notion, it is useful to bring attention to the unimaginably old practice of astrology, which has evolved in various forms all around the world, but always as a descriptive analysis of how the sun, moon, planets, and different stars influence human behavior. Another important matter to ponder is why certain temples were dedicated to either feminine or masculine deities. In ancient China, for example, Feng Shui geomancers spoke of the yin and yang, or feminine and masculine essence of the power places. One explanation of this is that the feminine and masculine deities may be mythic expressions of the subtle, gender-specific energies of different sacred places. Additionally, the matter of different energetic characteristics at power places sometimes went beyond a mere categorization of deities according to gender. Hinduism and other mythically rich religions have specific tales from the lives of deities. These tales are extremely important because they function as more precise indicators of the distinct power of a place. The legendary material associated with the different deities may, if properly decoded, indicate specific ways that certain power places will affect human beings. As we discover power places in the ancient world and become familiar with them, we become conscious of the existence of clusters of power places within specific geographical regions. This is known as sacred geography, which may be defined as the regional or even global geographic positioning of sacred places according to various mythological, symbolic, astrological, geodetic, and shamanic factors. Any discussion of the sacred geographic arrangement of temple sites upon the land must also mention the sacred geometry with which many of the temples were constructed. The formation of matter and the natural motions of the universe, from molecular vibration through the growth of organic forms to the spin and motion of planets, stars, and galaxies, are all governed by geometrical configurations of force. This geometry of nature is the essence of the sacred geometry used in the design and construction of so many of the world's ancient sacred shrines. These shrines encode ratios of creation and thereby mirror the universe. Certain shapes found in ancient temples 
developed and designed according to the mathematical constants of sacred geometry, actually gather, concentrate, and radiate specific modes of vibration. Fundamentally, sacred geometry is simply the ratio of numbers to each other. When such numerical ratios are incorporated into three-dimensional form, we have the most graceful and alluring architecture in the world. The German philosopher Goethe once said, architecture is frozen music. He was describing the relationship between musical ratios and their application to form and structure. An ancient Hindu architectural text says, the universe is present in the temple in the form of proportion. Therefore, when you are within a structure constructed with sacred geometry, you are within a model of the universe. The vibrational quality of sacred space thus brings your body, your mind, and at a deeper level, your soul into harmony with the universe. The popular importance of a pilgrimage place cannot be attributed only to its geographical location, its saintly founder, or its well-endowed temple. It is rather a compilation of these and several other factors. Pilgrimage places are endowed with a spiritual magnetism by association with the intrinsic power of the place, the sacred geography, the apparitions of supernatural beings, miraculous cures, in the beliefs about the power and sanctity of the site. Shrines are located at entry points in nature for spirit from other worlds. Trees and mountaintops are connections to the sky. Caves and springs, connections to an underworld. Pilgrimage places have been considered sites where the divine issues forth into the human realm. The shrine is a rupture in the ordinary domain through which heaven peaks. As places of power, pilgrimage sites function as doorways between heaven and earth, between this shore and the far shore. At these places, one's prayers are more quickly heard, one's petitions more readily fulfilled, and one's rituals more likely to bring blessings.
undertake a secret journey. What is the nature of their undertaking? What are the results? These questions guide us through an investigation of Pilgrim's motives, actions, and the impact of their journeys. To go on a pilgrimage is to take a journey out of the normal parameters of life. It can be an entry into a different, other world, a search for something new. The pilgrim is seeking something that will enhance or affirm their being and existence on one or more levels, something that may make them more complete. Pilgrimage is born of desire and belief. The desire is for the solution to problems of all kinds that arise within the human situation. The belief is that somewhere beyond the known world, there exists a power that can make right the difficulties that appear so insoluble and intractable in the here and now. Pilgrimages are meant to be transformative processes from which the individual emerges altered from their previous situation. The reaching out to God on the pilgrimage has implicit within it the reaching inward to the depths of one's own being. Pilgrimage can be seen as exterior mysticism, while mysticism can be seen as interior pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is a religious journey, either temporary or long, to a particular site or set of sites which have been invested with sanctity by tradition. Pilgrimage has many features of a rite of passage, geographic separation, exposure to sacred knowledge, the expectation of transformation. What a pilgrimage provides that many other rituals do not is an opportunity for each devotee to make his or her offering independently of others. Often it does not require the mediation of a priest or other religious functionary so that those requesting benediction can communicate directly with the divine. The only way by which we can effectively understand faith is for the social scientist, the anthropologist, to be willing to sacrifice their academic self and perhaps their personal, moral, and intellectual concepts and through this self-sacrifice to open themselves to the total unfettered participation in the process of spiritual quest. 
to subject themselves as nearly as possible to the same conditions to which pilgrims are subjected. It is surely arrogance to suppose that we can understand a phenomena that others say relates to the existence of spirits while we ourselves deny it. statue or image of the deity is considered to be the real embodiment of the deity. It is not just a device for the focusing of human intention and vision, but it is actually charged with the presence of God. Through a variety of consecration rituals, these statues are charged with the specific powers of the deities which they represent. When pilgrims touch, bathe, adorn, and honor the deities, they are seeking and attaining connection with the specific characteristics those deities are known for. The ancient Agama texts of Hinduism prescribe in minute detail the special methods for the consecration of temples and the fashioning of idols, the method of their installation, and the psychic and spiritual rituals to charge them with divine energy. The deity thereby becomes an individualization of the omnipresent.
long pageant of civilizations, endlessly rising, falling, and rising again, one phenomena has remained constant in the background. The continuing use of power places by one culture after another. Prehistoric and historic cultures keep coming and going, yet the power places have exerted a spiritual magnetism that transcends human time. The great religions of the historical era, Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam have each taken over the sacred places of earlier cultures and made them their own. Numerous different types of power places and sacred sites may be found around the world. Based on four decades of visiting more than 2,000 sacred sites in 165 countries and reading more than 2,000 books on the subject, I've identified the following distinct categories. Sacred Mountains Human-built sacred mountains Sacred bodies of water Sacred islands Healing springs Healing and power stones sacred trees and forest groves, places of ancient mythological importance, ancient ceremonial sites, ancient astronomical observatories, human erected solitary standing stones, megalithic chambered mounds, labyrinth sites, places with massive landscape carvings, regions delineated by sacred geography, oracular caves, mountains and sites, male deity, god shrines, yang sites, female deity, goddess shrines, yin sites, the birthplaces of saints, places where sages attained enlightenment, death places of saints, sites where relics of saints are kept, places with enigmatic fertility legends and statues, places with miracle-working icons, places chosen by animals or birds, places chosen by different geomantic divinatory methods, unique natural features, ancient esoteric schools, ancient monasteries, places where dragons were slain or sighted, places of Marian apparitions. It is important to understand that some of these categories overlap and that many sacred sites may be listed in two or more categories. Nonetheless, the many different ways to indicate the locations of power places are clearly evident. Ancient legends and modern day reports tell of extraordinary experiences that people have had while visiting these holy and magical places. Different sacred sites have the power to heal the body, enlighten the mind, increase creativity, develop psychic abilities, and awaken the soul to a knowing of its true purpose in life.
trying to explain the miraculous phenomenon reported at the sacred sites, I suggest there is a definite field of energy that saturates and surrounds the immediate locality of these holy places. Concentrated at particular holy sites is an energy field, a non-material field of influence extending in space and continuing in time. How may we explain the origin and ongoing vitality of these site-specific energy fields? What is it that makes a power place a power place? In my research, I recognize many different factors that contribute to the localized energy fields at the sacred sites. In the detailed writings on my World Pilgrimage Guide website at sacredsites.com, I classify and analyze those factors according to the four major categories of the influences of the Earth, the influences of celestial bodies, the influences of the structures at the sacred sites, and the influences of human intention. The fourth factor contributing to the power of sacred sites is perhaps the most mysterious and least understood. This is the accumulated force of human intention and the effect that it has upon the amplification of the power or the influence of the sacred site. Just as photographic film can record the energy of light, and as audio tape can record the energy of sound, so also can a sacred site record or somehow contain the energy and intention of the millions of humans who have performed a ceremony there. Consider what happens when a tea bag is placed in a cup of water. The essence of the tea steeps into the water and imparts its taste. Or, even more telling, what happens when a computer downloads a file wirelessly? There is a rapid transfer of information from source to receiver. there over hundreds or thousands of years. Praying and meditating, they have continuously charged and amplified the presence of love and peace, 
healing and wisdom. The sacred sites are repositories of the concentrated spiritual aspirations of humanity. These are the places where the Buddha, Moses, Jesus, Zoroaster, Guru Nanak, and other saints and shamans awakened to the deepest realizations of spiritual wisdom. I believe it is highly beneficial for people to make pilgrimages to sacred sites because of the transformational powers available at the sites. These legendary places have the mysterious capacity to awaken and catalyze within visitors the qualities of compassion, wisdom, peace of mind, and respect for the earth. The development of these qualities in increasing numbers of the human species is of vital importance considering the numerous ecological and social problems occurring in the world today. At the root of all of these problems is human ignorance. Many human beings are out of touch with themselves, their fellow beings, and the earth they live on. Sacred sites and their subtle energy fields of influence can assist in the awakening and transformation of human consciousness and thereby in the healing and revitalization of the earth. What are pilgrims doing when they are at the sacred sites? I wondered about this for the first two decades of my visits to pilgrimage places worldwide. I saw men and women, young and old, from various religions, expressing what appeared to be a variety of different emotions. 
I saw joy and anguish, hope and frustration on the pilgrims' faces. I wondered whether there were any common denominators in what I was observing. I found that there were. There were two essential commonalities to what pilgrims were doing. They were saying please and thank you. They were praying and expressing gratitude for prayers that had been answered. These intense emotions of the heart and mind preceded and transcended all the different religions practiced at the various sacred sites. What I was observing and feeling myself was the universality of the yearning and gratitude of the human soul. When you visit a sacred site, you are in the presence of the most concentrated expression of love on the planet. There are three broad categories of visitors to the sacred sites. By far the largest number are traditional pilgrims, Buddhists, Christians, Hindus, and Muslims going to their respective religions' holy places. In the second category are tourists visiting places of monumental architecture in various countries, Stonehenge in England, the pyramids in Egypt, Machu Picchu in Peru that had been sacred sites long before the development of tourism. And third, an increasing number of people like those of us in this auditorium are drawn to these places for reasons other than religion or tourism. Altogether, we are participating in the dawning of a Gaian age of pilgrimage.
Let me say a few words about how to benefit from the sacred sites. When you are at a sacred site, focus your attention with the intention that you are going to plug into the power of place as you would plug an electrical appliance into a wall socket. This metaphor is very helpful to embody as it actually predisposes you to have a more intense connection with the sacred sites. Maybe you will wander around first and then meditate or pray, or perhaps it will be the other way around. There are no rules. Simply let the spirit of the place and your own presence come into a relationship and then let go, letting it be whatever it is. The energy transference at the power places goes both ways, earth to human and human to earth. The wondrously beautiful living earth gives human beings subtle infusions of spirit and as pilgrims we give the earth something like planetary acupuncture in return. True, the power places were discovered mostly in the distant past but they remain vital today still emanating a potent field of transformational energy. Open yourself to this power of cosmic grace. Let it touch and teach you while the planet is in turn graced by your own love. There are many problems and much suffering around the world today. What can any of us as individuals do to help with this? Of course, there are outward actions such as environmental activism and social service programs that each of us may willingly involve ourselves in. However, there is something more fundamental that calls upon us. This is an inward action. Each and every one of us needs to dedicate ourselves day by day to becoming a wiser, kinder, and more honest person. Ultimately, nothing is more important than this. It is essential that we cultivate the qualities of compassion, nonviolence, and patience. We need to listen more and judge less. We need to express encouragement and gratitude frequently to both ourselves and to the many people we come in contact with. Self-awareness Self-love and self-acceptance are qualities that each and every one of us desperately needs. Remember, 
Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Always be kind and respectful. Everyone has goodness within them. Become a shining light of goodness yourself and you will be a potent force for goodness in the world. Wake up each morning and put goodness and beauty into the world. Thank you.